Hi everyone, today I would like to talk about our ongoing work on leveraging synthesis for code translation. From parallel programming to data analytics, we have seen the development of various domain-specific languages and frameworks across different fields. All of these languages pride themselves on different domain-specific optimization techniques. So to leverage them, one only needs to express their computation using the programming paradigms or DSLs that are exposed by such frameworks. And now the pace of these new frameworks have been particularly fast in deep learning as we see from this condensed timeline on the slide. And the explosion of such DSLs and frameworks pose new challenges for programmers who must now learn to master them in order to make their applications run efficiently. So for the past few years, my group has been working on tools and techniques to help developers write code easily without needing to worry about the underlying programming paradigm or framework. So let me give you an example. Suppose we want to express a row-wise mean of a matrix in Java. So here's a one simple implementation where we initialize an uh, integer array that stores the row-wise mean of every row, and then we just go through every row one after another. And then as, as we traverse each row, we would also go through each of the columns, and then finally sum everything up and divide to get the row-wise mean. As you can see, this is basically a computation expressed using nested loops over arrays. Now let's say we want to rewrite this piece of computation, but this time using a MapReduce uh, mechanism. So here is the exact same computation again, but it's now expressed using a function as a functional program over RDDs that are exposed by the Spark framework. You might imagine one way of doing this translation is to write a compiler. So we have all taken a compiler class. So this is basically the basis of a syntax-driven compilation. All we need to do is to express different patterns. So for example, in this case, here's a pattern that expresses that, that says that if we can recognize this particular form of the loop, then we can translate it into the equivalent map expression expressed using Spark or MapReduce. And in fact, there has been previous work in trying to solve this exact problem. So back in 2014, uh, there's a paper written uh, by a bunch of really smart uh, researchers, which basically tried to do this exact same thing. So here is one of the rules that they use to recognize the initial code pattern. And then in order to perform this translation for this kind of oblig obligatory program that counts uh, words, right, in a bunch of documents in Java, all that we need to do is to apply a bunch of rules and a few more rules. And finally, after 22 rules afterwards, we finally get our shiny program now written using MapReduce. So anyone in this syntax-driven comp compilation business will ask the question of why are there so many rules? And note that in this case, this is a very simple program that only does work counting in sequential, in sequential Java. And that already requires us to apply 22 different of these pattern matching rules. And now please don't get me wrong here. Um, so this is in fact a pioneer piece of work that actually shows us that it is indeed possible to do such translation from sequential Java into MapReduce. But what I'm trying to get at here is the fact that writing these rules is just hard. These rules are brittle in the sense that we might we'll never know whether we actually miss some rules that would lead to an incomplete translation. They are difficult to be correct to get right, right? So if any one of these translations turns out to be wrong, then it's really hard to catch them. And they're also hard to maintain. So just imagine maintaining hundreds of different rules to do these kind of pattern matching translation. And the problem doesn't stop here. So today, we might want to write a compiler that translates from Java to Spark. Tomorrow, we might want to write another compiler 
that translate from Java to SQL or any other kind of domain specific language that you can imagine. And the number of source languages also keep increasing. We have Java, we have C, Python, and some legacy code everywhere. So this is basically an arms race to build new compilers for every new DSL that appears on the horizon. So now let's try to take a step back and look at the problem from a different point of view. Here is the same problem again. Our goal here is try to translate from this Java program into functional MapReduce. So let's say we are the designer of Spark. We already have an intimate knowledge about how the Spark language works. Instead of doing a direct translation, what if we first design a high-level specification language? This language only has a few constructs, such as map and reduce, and that all the values must be derived from a series of these mappers and reducers. The language here doesn't capture all the concrete syntax of the target language here, so being Spark, but it already captures most of the functionality is provided. I claim that we can now write easily a syntax-driven compiler that translates from this high-level specification language into the concrete syntax of Spark or MapReduce. Now all we need to do is somehow re-express the original computation that we have using this high-level specification language, and we are done. Right? We call this process inference because we are basically trying to translate from the source here to this high-level spec language. And as, as a preview, I can tell you that we are not going to solve this problem using syntax-driven compilation. But before we actually discuss how we solve this inference problem, let's first tackle the question of how can we actually check that these two programs here are indeed computing the same thing. So instead of viewing this blue code as a program written in this high-level specification language, let's actually view this as a logical statement. In formal methods, as I'm sure many of you already know, this is basically a post condition. It is a logical assertion that states what needs to be true if, in this case, the code fragment actually terminates. Now, in order to prove that this post condition is indeed valid, we also need something known as loop invariance, which many of you are already familiar with, which just states what needs to be true while the loop is still executing. Now, we already have actually established a formal uh, mechanism to check if given, an, an, if given an invariant and a post condition, whether they, they, whether they are indeed valid or not. And these come in the form of something known as verification conditions. For example, we need to check that if we have a loop invariant, then that loop invariant is already true when we first enter the loop. We need to check that the loop invariant is preserved across multiple iterations of the loop. And finally, we need to check that if the loop actually terminates, then the loop invariant implies the post condition. I'm not going to bore you with the details in this case for this simple program here. All that I'm trying to say is that if we are given these loop invariants and post conditions, then there is actually a mechanical way to check whether these invariants and post conditions are indeed true. And if they are true, then in this case, our post condition is basically the program that we have been looking for in this inference process. Now, of course, the million dollar question is, how do we come up with these post conditions and invariants? After all, all that I've told you so far is that if we have such invariant and post condition, then there is a way to check. This is exactly the place where program synthesis comes into play. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with program synthesis, uh, but as a very simple introduction, a synthesizer, basically takes in two things as inputs. It takes in a description of the search space, and then it also takes in a bunch of constraints that describes what is a valid solution. And given these two inputs, hopefully we can turn the crank and then it will just come up with expressions from the search space that actually satisfies the constraints that we provided. 
In the problem in our hands right now, what are these solution constraints and what is the search space description? Well, the constraints are exactly the verification conditions that I alluded to earlier on the previous slide. They are indeed the governing conditions that state what a solution needs to satisfy in order for it to be a valid one. What about the search space description? How do we actually feed that in into the synthesizer? Well, one way of doing it is to do a simple code analysis on the input source code that we are trying to translate. For example, using data flow analysis, we can figure out that in this case, there are two different array variables that we are trying to manipulate. And a simple structural analysis will tell us that the operators that are involved uh, include something like addition and division. Given these two basic ingredients, we can now start to write possible invariants and post conditions of the following forms. So for instance, we might guess initially that the mean variable corresponds to a single map reduced, single map stage on the input matrix. Or we can guess that it actually consists of a two stage map followed by a reduction of the input matrix. And then the form of the mapper and reducer functions can be of various ways as stated here. Obviously, we are not going to really write out all these programs and enumerate them one after another for the synthesizer to choose. But instead, we're going to encode everything as a grammar that I've expressed here on the right hand side. So there we have both of the ingredients that we need to feed into the program synthesizer. We have the verification conditions as the constraints that govern what a valid solution should look like. And we have the expression grammar that talks about what is the space of programs that we are trying to search over. And if we run through them over a synthesizer, then hopefully the synthesizer will be able to come up with the invariants and post conditions that we have been looking for. As you probably heard earlier in the talks within this, um, within this seminar, there are probably a lot of different ways to solve this particular synthesis problem. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through details here, but the ones that we have used so far are basically different variants of the Stitches algorithm. Now, there are many different tricks that we actually play in terms of making this process efficient. For example, we try to solve incrementally in the sense that we try to initially give a simple expression grammar and then see if the synthesizer already returns a result. And if so, our job is done. Otherwise, we try to expand the grammar by adding more expressive uh, rules into the grammar so that it will consider more expressive expressions. And we also try to use a two-stage verification algorithm uh, in our synthesis process where we first try to synthesize within a bounded domain. For example, limiting all integer variables to be of size up to 10, for example. And then we see if we can already come up with invariants and post conditions. And if we already, saw, if we already can solve that problem, then we try to formally val validate any such post conditions using a theorem prover for full-blown verification. So there we have it. So in our, in, our, in, in our previous line of work, we have been using this approach where we first design a high level specification language where we can easily syntax comp compile into the target framework that we are trying to leverage. And then we are using inductive program synthesis to help us solve this inference process that translates from the input code into this high level specification code. We claim that this is kind of best of both worlds because if you think about syntax-driven compilation, it is basically dictated by the number of constructs that we have in the source language, in this case, this high-level spec. Because we basically need to write at least one rule for every construct in this source language in order to translate into something that is executable. So that is why translating from a high-level language with very few constructs is actually much better than direct translation from the source language like Java, which has tons of different types of constructs. 
On the other hand, the complexity of program synthesis is dictated by the target language, as the target language determines the size of the search space that the synthesizer needs to consider. So it would be a bad idea if we search directly in the target language uh, itself. But by first designing a high-level specification language, we actually capture the best of both worlds by enabling the synthesis to proceed really efficiently and coupling that with a very simple pattern-based syntax-driven compilation step. We call this combined approach verified lifting. It is lifting in the sense that we are converting or inferring a high-level specification from the input source code. As you know, this basically goes against typical program compilation because rather than going from a high level to a low level uh, representation, we're actually reverting it by first taking in the input source code and trying to lift it up to a higher level uh, representation. And it is also called verified because anything that comes out from our compiler is guaranteed to be sound because we actually run through all uh, found post condition through a theorem prover to make sure that it is actually valid and semantically preserving. So for the rest of this talk, let me illustrate verified lifting using one of the uh, compilers that we have built earlier called Casper. And Casper is exactly trying to solve this problem I was referring to earlier in terms of compiling sequential Java program to MapReduce. The Casper toolchain works in the following way. So we take input source code with, written in sequential Java, and then we have a very simple code fragment identifier. All it does is it basically tries to extract out pieces of code that may be amenable to translate into MapReduce. And for each of these identified code fragments, we then try to go through this synthesis process where we try to lift it to a high level representation uh, represented using the uh, language constructs I alluded to earlier. And if all goes well, then it goes through the subsequent code generation step where we then actually generate executable code and we stitch that back into the input application. And then we now have this input program now rewritten using Spark. For evaluation purposes, we collected a bunch of benchmarks from uh, different type, different domains to try to validate our Casper compiler. And these benchmarks come from classical MapReduce problems that you can imagine, such as word count and other kinds of MapReduce problems. And then to data analytical tasks, uh, arithmetic, statistical, and even image processing operations. So our evaluation shows that we are actually able to translate quite a bit of them uh, across, around uh, the benchmarks that we put in, around 80%. And there are a bunch of cases where we failed to translate. Some of the reasons include the input program uses some library methods that we are, un that we are unfamiliar with. So since we don't understand the semantics of what goes on inside those library calls, we are unable to translate the corresponding input code. Some of them was due to the limitation of the grammar that we actually provide. So for example, it might actually, in, uh, in, it might actually involve a multi map reduced stage and then we only limit it to two stages, for example. So therefore we're not able to translate in those cases. And then a bunch of them were just due to the synthesizer timing out without returning anything. So I would basically also uh, say that in, the, in recent years, we have seen a lot of new advances in program synthesis, and some of them you probably already heard of uh, within this seminar. So we expect this synthesis timing out step to be uh, becoming less and less of a problem going onwards. But now let's also take a look at the translated, translated code. I mean, after all, we are trying to uh, be more efficient in terms of the execution of the input program. So are we able to actually achieve that? So here I have highlighted a bunch of sample benchmarks from the benchmark suites that we uh, collected. So these three bars here correspond to the translation performed by the mode compiler, which is this syntax-driven compilation tool that I referred to earlier in the beginning of the talk. 
And in here, the y-axis shows the amount of speed up as compared to the sequential Java implementation from the beginning. The green bars here show the performance of the translated code that is generated by Casper. And as you can see here, the mean speed up across the benchmarks is around 20x compared to the original sequential code. And we are able to translate all the benchmarks that Mode was able to translate. And on the other hand, since Mode is not uh, open source and we are not able to get a copy of it, so therefore we were unable to evaluate it across the other benchmarks that we were able to collect. Now, however, our evaluation also includes a human-based evaluation step. In this case, we actually hired expert Spark programmers on, uh, a, on, the, uh, on the online platform and we try to we basically ask them to manually translate all these benchmarks by hand and we also compare the performance of those translated benchmarks compared to the ones that spark was uh, sorry casper was able to come up with so as you can see here our implementation is actually quite competitive even against human experts you might note that in one of the benchmarks here 3d histogram uh, the human manual translated implementation turns out to be much faster than what Casper was able to find. And the reason for that was because our expert programmer was able to, uh, was, was actually knowledgeable of part of the Spark API that does exactly a 3D histogram computation versus in our case for Casper was un unaware of that particular API. So it basically tries to translate that into a multi-stage map reduce and therefore turns out to be slower than using the specialized benchmark that the human is able to uh, is no as knowledgeable of now you might say okay that's so far so good but what about the time that it actually takes to do this compilation using casper well so it takes on average around six minutes to actually do the compilation step with the median being only two minutes you might say well this is actually quite a bit slower than something that you might be able to get from something like Java C or any kind of compiler that you might be familiar with. So I would claim that that is perhaps the wrong measure uh, here because in this case we shouldn't be measuring against those syntax driven compilers. We should really be measuring against the time that it takes to hire these experts and doing this completely manually for instance. It literally took us weeks to do so. So you can imagine if you're working in a company and you have all these benchmarks that you are trying to translate, then the, then the time that it takes to hire these people and then bring them up to speed is perhaps not of that uh, being very competitive as compared to the time that it takes for a synthesis-based approach to do so. So as a recap, this is the uh, verified lifting toolchain that we have been developing uh, over the past few years. And this is basically the general framework that we have uh, for, for doing code translation. And in addition to the uh, sequential Java to Spark uh, compiler that we have built earlier, we have actually also applied this paradigm to translate code from different types of domains. For instance, earlier we have uh, implemented another compiler called Dexter that takes C++ code and would translate into a domain-specific language called Halide for image processing, stencil computation. We have also used this approach to build another compiler that takes sequential Java programs uh, that uses uh, object relational mapping libraries like Django and uh, we basically translate these Java programs into SQL uh, queries. And the advantage of doing that is now we're able to leverage the uh, optimizers that relational databases come with. And we're able to get quite a, bit, quite a bit of speed up as a result of doing that. And we have also used the same paradigm to build a domain-specific compiler that takes C code and compile it down to a programmable switch produced by this uh, company uh, earlier in the, down in the valley. So I want to say that like, you know, we are basically just enabling all these different codes and programs by using our techniques to leverage these different backends. The speed up that we get is actually all due to the actual backend implementation itself. For example, like the implementation of Spark, so on and so forth. Our technique is basically the enabler 
that allows these uh, existing programs to leverage these frameworks easily without building another syntax-driven compiler. So after all these different um, different lines of work that we have pursued earlier, we got a lot of requests by asking us to translate from a new source language into yet another target language. So now we are trying to abstract this whole thing out into something called MetaLift. So it's basically a tool chain that we are trying to build that would enable other people to build their own verified lifting based compiler tool chain. The way that it works is uh, our framework is going to ask the user to provide us with a bunch of code fragments that they're interested in translating. So this can be done programmatically, for instance, by identifying all loopy programs or all specific programs that iterate over list or arrays, so on and so forth. And then we also ask the user to also provide us with a specification language. Uh, of, so this will be the high level spec language that we have designed earlier. And finally, how to generate code from this high level spec into the actual executable target platform. I encourage you to go visit this website if you're interested. And we are actually in active development of this, um, of this framework. And some of, the, some of the compilers that we have built earlier, for example, the translation to Halite one has already been deployed at Adobe. And some, in fact, some of the generated code using the Dexter compiler is now shipping with Adobe Photoshop. So in this short talk, I have introduced you to this new line of work that we have been building upon that uses program synthesis to, do code, to build code translators. Specifically, in this talk, I have illustrated our technique using the Casper compiler, which basically translates from sequential Java programs into MapReduce and Spark. And MetaLift is the framework that we are currently building that hopefully would enable other users to leverage our technique without being a synthesis expert. And with that, thank you very much for listening, and I'd love to hear your questions if you have any of them. Thank you very much.